celebrities included, saying, actually, I, I don't want to be described as a feminist. I see that as divisive. Okay. Well, feminism, like any other ism, like Marxism or liberalism, has to be taken as a political movement. So it isn't the case that if you believe in equality between men and women, you're automatically a feminist. You have to look at their policies and who their leaders are. And at the moment, I think it's one of the most divisive and exclusionary groups out there. Just look at feminism in London, a big conference being held in London in a few weeks' time. They have no platform, some very serious feminist thinkers, because they don't fit into a very specific mold of feminism, perhaps because they distinguish between women and transgender people or because they are pro-pornography. Lots of different reasons, but they don't actually want to bring these women together to discuss women's issues. They want to exclude them and they only want to have a very specific platform that the most women, truly most women, just can't fit into. Susan Sarandon, uh, Meryl Streep, Marianne Cotillard all, all talked about themselves as not wanting to describe themselves as feminists. They talked about themselves being humanists. And there was a huge backlash, particularly to Marianne Cotillard, wasn't there, uh, by their saying, well, well, how can you say you're not a feminist? I think it's, uh, very, been, very, it's been very very difficult for a long time. There's been a lot of PR against uh, this whole idea that you know you won't be considered attractive or you'll be considered too radical to be taken seriously. One of the things I'm excited about is that's changing. And I have to agree with you about the Feminism in London conference. It's one example of many of women organising uh, a whole manner of different events that actually are, are radicalising and including women of all different backgrounds. One of the beauties of feminism is that it's grassroots. You don't, the whole point is you don't necessarily have to have, and in fact probably shouldn't have, a hierarchical structure or one leader. Then why are it's, they censoring prominent feminists? Well, they're, they're, I think you can't take one conference and say, this is, you, I, will, I want it run this way. Julie they, Bindle, they have, for they example. To, Julie Bindle is a great example of a feminist who's been very active and very outspoken, she's, and she's banned from conferences around the country. She, she's, she's a fan, I'm the, a big fan of Julie. Bindle, and, and I've been involved in running Weekend the Night, and we've had her speak for us many times. You can't take, what you have to do is go, look at all the amazing stuff that's going on. Some uh, people are speaking at different ones because of different politics, of course, but that's because the movement is broad. You can't have an agreement amongst 50% of the population. It's just not going to happen. What you can have is debate, and, and you can exactly have people who like Julie, who are going to be absolutely right for one crowd, who are going to divide others, but that's the beauty of feminism. It allows us to actually know and grow and learn together. It's an evolution. I think you've actually hit the nail on the head about why women aren't associating as feminists because you're right. I didn't say that. It's very <laughs> well, it's, like you said, it's very difficult to get 50% or more of the population to agree to one thing and feminism is political and at the moment it's the arm of a left-wing ideology. They're calling for anti-austerity, they're calling for things that a lot of more conservative women, more libertarian women, more independent thinkers like, just can't fit But into. people like Beyonce, I would totally disagree with you, I actually do think austerity hits women hard. I think a lot of women who, have, who are traditionally not necessarily part of the movement are, are noticing that and coming towards like a, an awakening in ma on many levels because they've been treated so badly. But you've I also got conservative feminists of huge status, like Beyonce, who's very much about, I can have as much money as men, I can take as much space Beyonce as Beyonce isn't which conservative. Is, but then we've heard from the, the stars well, of the films, uh, Hollywood stars saying, Emily Blunt, for example, Patricia Arquette saying, no, this isn't right. We are not getting paid the same. We're yeah. not getting paid the same. There aren't female directors. This is my there aren't this uh, financiers my saying, we will mm. give you the money. It's is, is just doing a huge thing at the BFI this, you know, this week about trying to her institute, trying to change these things. This is the real. number one reason that I personally can't associate with feminism because especially in the West, what feminism is attacking is not violence on women and not violence on women across the globe. It's focusing on things like the gender pay gap, which the Office of National Statistics has proven is not true for women between the ages of 20 and 40. It's the gender on pay things, gap is still it's just under 10%, isn't it? 9.4%. If, if you start taking in the reasons why there's a gender pay gap, like women choosing to work less hours and women choosing to take time off and the pay gap basically disappears and lots of feminists like to say well we need to protect women because women aren't capable of making their own choices they are no not they, yes they are they're saying we're not <laughs> capable of choosing to take the same route that some of our male counterparts are in which case women are actually more likely to be promoted and more likely to make more money. But a lot of feminists say if you don't fit into that very particular field where you can't make other choices, then we don't want to accept I you. We're going to no platform you. And you, you know, there was I think a time. It's very strange that you are lumping so, like, quite specific things into all feminism. It's like you're doing exactly what you're accusing feminists of doing. You're saying, well, blanketly, all feminists do this. I mean, actually, as I, I, I was saying. I never said all feminists do that, but I'm saying that. You're using it as a blanket word, that feminism, just feminists. And, and when I, you have I was celebrities, personally. When you have celebrities who decide to take on feminism, and make themselves the voice of feminism. You have to understand that those are your political leaders in the same way that people won't be conservative because of David Cameron or they won't be Labour because of Jeremy Corbyn when Lena Dunham and Emily Blunt come onto the stage and they say we're feminism, this is what it means, and you have big conferences, no platforming people, it makes it impossible for other okay, people. We also oh, have big uh, conferences where okay, we are Rebecca, put, sorry, You didn't frankly have the balls to put country before party.
Labour says that on average, women earn £210,000 less than men during their careers. The campaign's obtained the backing of high-profile women from all walks of life, including business, politics and the media. Women are still only earning 81 pence for every pound that men earn in this country. And if we carry on at the current rate, it's going to take another 52 years. 52 years for that pay um, divide to, um, di to disappear. I mean, you know, we've been waiting 44 years since the Equal Pay Act. It shouldn't take a century. Well, that is the subject of today's Sky Debate. Are women unfairly paid less than men? How real? is the pay divide between men and women and should firms be shamed over it? Well, joining us now to discuss that are the feminist activist and comedian Kate Smurthwaite and Kate Andrews, who's head of, the head of communications at the Adam Smith Institute. Before we get started, though, a reminder that you can join the debate to tweet at Jane Secker Sky, including the hashtag SkyDebate, text 84501 or email news at sky.com and let us know what you think or if there are any points you want to put to the guests and we'll try to read out some of your comments as we go along. Uh, Kate Andrews, let's start with you. We know that women are paid less than men. The facts are incontrovertible. But do you think it's fair? Do you think women deserve to earn less? Of course, they take time off to have children, don't they? They often want to work part-time when they come back. Why should they be paid the same as their male colleagues? Well, it, there's no doubt that women still face hurdles in the workforce, but these hurdles seem to be there despite the fact that their employees, uh, that their employers uh, tend to pay them more in many circumstances that their employers tend to promote them more in certain circumstances. The Office of, Nation of National Statistics found just a couple of weeks ago that women aged between 20 and 40 tend to earn on average 1.1 percent more than their male counterparts. And another recent study found that if women don't exit the workplace, they tend to get promoted more aggressively than their male counterparts. So it doesn't seem to be the case that employers are trying to pay women less based on their gender. It seems to be other factors that are creating this gap. And most of them are cultural. Most of them have to do with the fact that women are leaving the workplace to have children or they're choosing jobs to make it easier to have children and that's a problem for us that's a problem for society it's not something that government should be legislating against perhaps we have unfair expectations and traditional expectations on women that shouldn't exist in 2014 well let's put those points to kate smirk wait is that a fair point kate you know, it's just reflecting society employers aren't sitting there looking at their pay scales and going oh she's a woman we can get away with paying her a bit less they're simply reflecting what society thinks well, I mean, first of all, this idea that it all comes down to women choosing to have children, etc., etc. Um, I, I mean, I mean there's, there's almost three things I need to say about that. Firstly, I don't want to live in a world where people who choose to have children are then unable to get good work after and unable to continue their careers. Secondly, if women were paid more equally and treated more fairly in the workplace, I think there's a good chance we'd see more of them wanting to come back to work full time, wanting and being able to afford childcare and wanting to take that on. And if you're in a relationship, um, you know, a, a male female relationship, and the guy is earning much more than the woman, the decision for her to take the time off to look after the children might well not even be a, a cultural or a social one. It might well just be a practical one that, that the higher earner has to be the one that keeps working. So we should be challenging these things at every step of it. But also, I don't believe that women's life choices are actually what's driving the pay gap. If that were the case, we would reasonably expect to see that women who have reached the top of their professions across the board are women who don't have children. You know, let's look at women without a cleaner at home. Are they on a level pegging with men? And, and the answer is no. In actual fact, it doesn't seem to be the case that women who don't have children are racing through and, and you know, making it into the higher echelons of our society. If we look at the most successful women, uh, you know, in the country, from Margaret Thatcher to Kate Winslet, actually many of them have children. In fact, it doesn't seem to be about these life choices. And, and bearing in mind that we're talking about women choosing to take on caring roles, now put that into context of the fact that even in the caring industry, where women have all this extra experience, they still earn £100,000 in a lifetime less than their male counterparts in the same industry. So it's clearly not about life choices. It's clearly about not conscious sexism, not people deliberately saying, let's pay all the women a bit less, but women not being taken seriously in the workplace, people assuming women are not ambitious. When women are ambitious, then being told that they're being aggressive and that it's not feminine and, and all that kind of stuff that all combines together a, a sort of a million micro incidents of sexism that add up over a lifetime, yes, okay. frighteningly, Okay, let's, let's let the other Kate get, get a, a word in edgeways. Um, Kate, you know, is, is Kate right that, that perhaps women aren't, don't want to be seen as aggressive in the workplace? I'll give you an anecdote. When I started off in this job, I discovered that a colleague was being paid two grand more than me, went to ask my boss why, and he said, because he asked for it. Women just don't ask. Is that part of the problem? 
It may be part of the problem. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that women aren't asking for higher salaries when they first come into the workplace. And that does have an effect on the gender wage gap. But I like so much of what Kate just said, and I completely agree with her, that men who could be staying at home with kids or have a more financially good reason to be staying home with the kids when, they're women, when women and their wives and their partners are earning more should be. Uh, this isn't the case that um, you know women should just be staying at home with the kids and we should adopt these traditional aspects. I completely agree that we need to have a complete reform as a whole. Society as a whole needs to change their minds about what women should be doing in the workplace. But to go back to earning less in very specific circumstances when they have the exact same job as the male employees. These statistics are very misleading. Uh, they tend to be very broad and grouped together all different kinds of professions. So doctors and physicians will be in one big group together, or all child-minding professions will be in one big group together. And they will compare GPs who are working nine to five in very important, very good jobs to surgeons who have had 20 years of training, okay, who have this? very unflexible hours. What about this comparison? Sorry to interrupt you, but it's been in the news this week because of the leaks from Sony over the emails. The film American Hustle, the two female stars, Jennifer Lawrence and Amy Andrews, they were paid less on the back-end deal, as it's called, that the money that they get after the film is successful. They were paid 7%. The men were paid 9%. The two women were the stars of that film. They went on to win Golden Globe Globes. The men didn't. Why were they paid less? I'm not sure particularly which film we're talking about, but American I would have Hustle. to ask... Uh, oh, American Hustle. It was the second um, biggest well, the, the, film last year. Okay, thank you. Well, Jennifer Lawrence had a supporting role in that film. I think that very much dictates why she would have less of a, a stake in that. When it comes to Amy Adams, I can't... Oh, she got a Golden Globe. I mean, but we don't compare the success of somebody in terms of their artistic ability necessarily um, to the amount of time that they're actually spending working. Jennifer Lawrence had less shoots to do. She had less time that she had to be in hair and makeup. She had less time to be on the set. And um, both of these women are absolutely phenomenal. Women in films spend less time sure, in hair sure and makeup. Kate, what's, Kate, what's your point? Well, I'm not sure we can argue. I'm not sure we can argue that women in films spend less time in hair and makeup. I think they're forced to sustain a much higher beauty standard uh, than well, men in, in that similar particular roles. Film, I mean, I mean certainly. obviously. But 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 look at look at the two women that we're talking about right now. We're talking about two of the most successful women on the planet. I care about the but average so woman who's going to work every day, who who's not being. Job. But they're not necessarily getting paid less than the men who do the same jobs. The National, uh, the, yeah, the national Statistics Office, no, they found that women between the ages of 20 and 40, they found this out a couple of weeks ago, that they are getting paid 1.1% more than their male colleagues. Your point place and or that they'd be more encouraged to come back to the workplace if they were earning as much as their male colleagues just isn't true they are earning more than their male, co male colleagues on average today this was found by by the british government these women but, it's not, but it it what, what's happening what happens is that when these numbers come out because there is such a backlash against anybody and it was really fascinating a minute ago uh, you know you were asked what is it that's causing these kind of discrepancies and it seemed like no one would say it out loud I have an answer to that question it's called sexism you know some of it overt some of it very in your face I've absolutely I've had various jobs over the years I've absolutely been told to my face sometimes oh we don't really want a woman in this role this kind of thing um, you know working as a performer now in, in comedy we hear about women are they funny etc I hear it all the time so there is overt you think, sexism. There's also I just want to clarify. Sexism. I just want to clarify. You think that Jennifer Lawrence and Amy Adams were paid 7% instead of 9%, not because of previous experience, not because of negotiations that they had formerly with potentially their agents, with potentially the movie agency. You think it's because we are inherently sexist and there's just no scenario in which Jennifer Lawrence could possibly be paid less than Bradley Cooper. I mean, to no, me, no, that just makes no, absolutely no, no, no sense. No, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I, there, of course there are films in which you might get paid more, but overall, on average, this is what the pay gap is about. It's not about saying, here's one woman, what does she earn compared to the next guy? It's about saying, overall, as a society, are we valuing men and women equally? And the answer is obviously not. Now, you know, there are two ways of looking at it. Here's the you are and your we are Let unfortunately. Me finish. Let me finish. Here's the thing. You are, you, what you are doing is what happens so often on these issues is you pick up on the one statistic. Actually, in this narrow little age range, in this little region, we found women were doing a teeny little bit better. So there you go. There's no problem. Overall, there is a pay gap. Overall, there is a huge pay gap. And is it that women are less intelligent, less capable, less hardworking? I well, don't believe that's true. Not. So what it must be is that somewhere in our society, there is sexual discrimination going on. Not necessarily overt all of the time, although sometimes overt.
time just in women not being taken seriously. You talk about why don't women ask for a pay rise, and yet there have been studies which show that when women do ask for a pay rise, they're seen as a nuisance, they're seen as bothersome, they're seen as, uh, as being, you know, too aggressive, and you they're then not take... only not given it, but, but marked down for, okay. for having even asked. Okay, so, you, okay, so women are making very smart choices. Okay, Kate Anderson, final you question, because jumped. Kate's right, isn't she? She's looking at the overall picture. The pay gap is still 9.6%. Yes. Why is it that we have to wait till another 50-odd years for equal pay, according to projections, when the Equal Pay Act was back in 1970? Why do women have to wait? We are not waiting another 50 years for equal pay. If you are coming into the workforce as a, if you are coming into the workforce as a young woman, you are most likely going to be making more now than your male counterpart, and that's something that the British that's government came up with a few weeks ago. That's not just my personal opinion. If you want to look at the overall spectrum of the situation, you have jumped from saying that there is a pay gap, and thus it must be sexism, and we have completely ignored the fact that women are still choosing to stay home with their children, that men are not but being helpful not enough to stay home with their children, that. that women are that women are making more than their male counterparts counterparts before they leave the workplace, that they're more likely to get promoted than their male counterparts when they're in the workplace. You've jumped over all of these very important facts that contribute sexism. to the wage gap. You won't even say the I, word. What about sexism? Surely you've got I'm, to admit that I'm, some of it is plain old-fashioned sexism. Well, of course there is still sexism in various parts well, of our society. Well, let's challenge that in this well, very simple, to very that. niche would... way by making companies publish their pay gap. It's not a big ask. We're only yeah. talking about companies with 250 I would love, employees. I would love to challenge sexism in a real way, but asking companies to publish arbitrary numbers when they broadly categorize different occupations together that shouldn't be categorized together, to put it out to the public with